Hi guys, I have remade this video so many times, I can't explain. It's been probably the most difficult video I've ever made. It's on line emission spectra and I just want to give you a bit of background as to how I approached it. So I have lots of different textbooks, both A-level, different exam boards and IB. And they all cover this particular topic in differing amounts of detail. So I was trying to work out how I was going to pitch this, at what level, and I realised that I was making the video and it just wasn't making sense because you guys didn't have enough background information. So I hope you don't mind, but I'm going with my gut instinct and I'm going to give you the background information. We're going to touch on GCSE physics and hopefully it'll help you understand this topic far more easily because it's pretty damn difficult. The start of AS level chemistry, of IB chemistry, is really, really tricky and much more difficult than GCSE, so bear with me. We need to touch on GCSE physics in order to understand this topic. So remember you studied the electromagnetic spectrum and if you actually looked at the waves, remember that they start really long here, very long wavelength, and then as you get further up, they get closer together. So the ones with the long wavelength, those were radio waves. They were fairly low frequency. And then as you move to the other end of the spectrum, they get closer together, the wavelength shortens, so remember that's the distance between two peaks or two troughs, and they have a higher frequency. The point is, the wave continues, and then as it gets closer together, you move towards the X-ray end. As the waves get further apart, you are at the radio wave end, and that's why we call it a spectrum. Another thing you need to remember is that when you shine light at a prism, so remember a prism is like a glass pyramid, and Sir Isaac Newton did this in the 1600s. So he shone a light into the prism, just normal visible light, it looks quite yellowy, and it split up and he could see effectively the rainbow. And that showed him that visible light is made up of lots of different colours. So he did that in the 1600s, and now that becomes relevant when we look at line emission spectra. Because if you take an element, such as sodium, and you put lots of energy into it, you add a high voltage to it while it is at low pressure, that sodium emits light and when you shine that light through a prism, instead of forming a continuum, so a spectrum, lots of different colours, what you see instead is a black background with two lines and these lines are yellow and they correspond to very specific wavelengths of light and you will only see these two yellow lines at 589 nanometers wavelength for sodium. So it's a great kind of fingerprint for sodium. If you don't know what the element is, you make it gaseous, you give it a lot of voltage, you cause its light to shine through a prism, and you look at what you've got, it will have a very characteristic line spectrum depending on the element you are studying. So those two lines at 589 nanometers, that will be sodium, hydrogen would look different, potassium would look different. So at GCSC, you met flame tests, you learned that if you had an unknown compound, you could hold it in a blue roaring flame. You would see various colours. That isn't very accurate because things like calcium and lithium will both give shades of red. We don't like to use that when we're looking at high level. A line emission spectrum is a great way of categorically identifying an element. So let's look back in time and look at how the structure of the atom has changed and our understanding of it. So historically the plum pudding model was a widely accepted model for the structure of the atom. A plum pudding is similar to a Christmas pudding, the thinking being that the sponge portion of the plum pudding was the positive charge and that embedded within that plum pudding were plums and they were supposed to represent electrons. So that was widely accepted in approximately the 1800s. Then Rutherford was a second scientist who came along and he thought, no, I do not believe in the plum pudding model and I'm going to disprove it. So he decided to fire alpha particles. Now, if you remember this from GCSE physics, an alpha particle is made up of two protons and two neutrons. So he fired alpha particles at gold foil. Now those alpha particles mostly pass straight through the gold foil and that led him to the conclusion that an atom is largely empty space, immediately dispelling the model, the plum pudding model, because clearly, if it's a huge sphere, there isn't a lot of empty space in there. Um, so that automatically told him that the plum pudding model was wrong. So these alpha particles passed straight through, and some were deflected, but only very few were deflected. So when they were deflected, he knew that they'd hit something positive. The fact that very few were deflected told him that the nucleus must therefore be very small. So Rutherford was the guy that decided that an atom, instead of being plum pudding-esque, was a very tiny nucleus and that the rest of it was largely empty space. 
Four then came along and was like, hang on, we need to find out more about this. I'm not completely happy with Rutherford's model. So he was the guy that actually discovered the existence of shells, and now we're going to talk about that in greater detail. So he decided that the nucleus of an atom contained the protons, and he looked specifically at hydrogen. Now remember, if you look at hydrogen in the periodic table, it has an atomic number of one, which means it only has one electron. So he looked at the simplest element, and he decided that the electrons were orbiting the nucleus in much the same way that a planet orbits the sun. So he looked at the nucleus, he decided the electron was orbiting, and then at this point what he decided to do was give it a huge amount of energy to that single electron and see what happened to it. And what he found out was that electron, when it's given a huge amount of energy, becomes excited, and it goes from being close to the nucleus, and it moves away from the nucleus to what we now know to be a higher energy level. And we use the letter N to represent a higher energy level. So we excite that electron and it goes from being N equals 1, which is at its ground state, to potentially being N equals 2, N equals 3, N equals 4. So it can go to any one of these higher energy levels. The point being, however, that it only stays excited for a fraction of a second and then it will fall back down to a lower energy level or it will return to its base or ground energy level. When it falls back, what happens is it emits a photon, which is a discrete packet of energy, and this corresponds to a particular wavelength. And if we look at that line emission spectra, that particular wavelength will be a specific colour. So it could be yellow, it could be blue, but it will be very much corresponding to a particular element and an electron moving back to a particular energy level. We're now going to carry on looking at hydrogen more closely. So we're going to excite hydrogen, we're going to give it a huge amount of voltage, and those electrons are going to become excited. And this is when various examples will differ. Um, and this may be too much detail for some of you, but I'm just making a general video about line emission spectrum. So if you find that you have excited your electrons and they are returning back to energy level 2, so n equals 2, you find that this occurs in the visible part of the spectrum. And we call this, just a random name, we call this the Balmer series, and this is just the guy that discovered this. If electrons are returning to an even lower energy level, this time n equals 1, this occurs in the UV part of the spectrum, and we call this the Lyman series. And lastly, if we're returning to energy level 3, that occurs in the infrared part of the spectrum, and we call that the Passion series. For most of you, this won't be relevant, but I know IB will, people will need this. So the line emission spectra for hydrogen provided evidence that there are distinct energy levels around the nucleus. Notice that those energy levels get closer together the further away from the nucleus, so clearly those electrons in the furthest away shells will have the most amount of energy. And we say that eventually those shells get so close together that they merge, they form a continuum, and at this point those electrons can have any energy and they are no longer under the influence or under the pull of the positive nucleus and we call them free electrons. I just wanted to go over a few questions. Don't worry if your exam format is in multiple choice. You've got to realise that any practice is good practice and if you can answer these questions then you're doing great. Particularly at A-level where there are less resources available, you need to be doing absolutely everything. So these are IB pass questions but it doesn't matter. So question two, energy levels for an electron in a hydrogen atom are well, let's not look at the answers yet. I always like to think about what I think the answer should be and then hopefully I'll see it below. Remember I told you that the energy levels get closer together the further away they are from the nucleus. They eventually merge, forming a continuum. So let's see if any of these answers are similar to what I just said. A, evenly spaced. Well, no. Farther apart near the nucleus. Yes, they would be farther apart near the nucleus because they get closer together further away from the nucleus. Closer together near the nucleus, no, that argues with what I said, arranged randomly, that's just a bit of a meh answer. So the answer here is B. Which statement is correct for the emission spectrum of the hydrogen atom? Here I can't start working out the answer because it's quite a vague question, so we just need to go through each point in turn. The lines converge at lower energies, so that means they get closer together. No, they get closer together at higher energies, which is why A is incorrect. The lines are produced when electrons move from lower to higher energy levels. No, that's wrong. They're produced when they fall back down from a high energy level to a low energy level. The lines in the visible region involve electron transitions into the energy level closest to the nucleus. 
No, remember in the visible part of the spectrum, they're returning to the second energy level, n equals 2. So obviously that's not the closest to the nucleus because that would be n equals 1. The line corresponding to the greatest emission of energy is in the ultraviolet region. Yes, that is correct. That corresponds to electrons returning to n equals 1. Which statement is correct about a line emission spectrum? Again, a vague question, so we're just going to have to go through the options. Electrons absorb energy as they move from a low to high energy level. So this is a difficult question because although A is correct and that electrons absorb energy as they move from light, low to high energy levels, remember we're talking about how the line emission spectrum comes about and that's due to electrons falling back to low energy levels, releasing a photon of light which corresponds to a specific wavelength, which is why I don't think A is the right answer. Electrons absorb energy as they move from high to low energy levels. No, we know that they release it. Electrons release energy as they move from low to high energy levels. No, that's the wrong way around. And then finally, D, electrons release energy as they move from high to low energy levels. Yes, when they fall back down, they release the photon. They release a specific packet of energy. So next video, we'll be talking about sublevels and writing electronic configurations. For me, this video was so essential to give you background information. I'm getting lots of comments and questions about how hard A-level chemistry is, how hard IB chemistry is, and you cannot expect to do well and progress well with the subject unless you know background, background, background information. It is totally key, and this is why it's taken me so long to make this video, because it was really important to me that I gave you a thorough grounding. So I hope you understand that, guys. Anyway, I'll be back soon with another video, hopefully less serious next time.